My name is Sean Casey, and I teach at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., and I am the current chair of the AAR's Committee on the Public Understanding of Religion. Today we are honoring biblical scholar and theologian Elizabeth Schuschler Fiorenza as the recipient of the 2012 Martin Marty Award in the Public Understanding of Religion. As this year's Marty Award winner, Elizabeth Schuschler Fiorenza will be interviewed about her work by Judith Plasco, a former president of the AAR. The Public Understanding Religion Committee chose Elizabeth from the nominations submitted earlier in this year, awarded annually since 1996. The Martin Marty Award recognizes outstanding contributions to the public understanding of religion. The award goes to those whose work has a relevance and an eloquence that speaks not just to scholars, but to the broader public as well. Schuschler Fiorenza is the Christopher Stendhal Professor of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School and has done pioneering work in biblical interpretation and feminist theology. Her teaching and research focus on questions of biblical and theological epistemology, hermeneutics, rhetoric, and the politics of interpretation, as well as of issues of theological education, radical equality, and democracy. Professor Schuss Lorenz is co-founder and co-editor of the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion, and has been a founding co-editor of the Feminist Issues of Concilium. She was elected the first woman president of the Society of Biblical Literature, and has served on boards of major biblical journals and societies. In 2001, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in recognition of her work, she has received uh, honorary doctorates from at least seven institutions. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of those. Um, in 2001, she was the recipient of the Society of Biblical Literature's Excellence in Mentoring Award. Her published works, which again are probably too numerous to list, but I will simply mention In Memory of Her, which has been translated into 13 different languages, which is testimony to her wide and deep influence uh, in many, many different spheres. She has been active, has been an active member of the Women's Ordination Conference and a longtime supporter of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, an association of men and women committed with the struggle for the liberation of the third world, third world peoples by promoting new models of theology for religious pluralism, social justice, and peace. She has participated in numerous feminist and womanist endeavors focused on bringing scholars and activists together including the 2011 International Symposium on Peace Building in Society and Religion, Feminist Practices of Intercultural Transformation. She's been interviewed by the BBC, the Belgian Broadcasting Company, the Swiss Television Network, and the Australian Broadcasting Company, and has been a pioneering advocate for human rights both nationally and internationally. Please join me and welcoming and honoring this year's Martin Marty Award, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza. Thank you, Elizabeth, and we look forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I want especially to thank the award committee for this great honor and acknowledgement, not only of my own work, but also of critical feminist work in the academy. Thank you very much, all of you who have come here today. So first of all, let me add my congratulations, Elizabeth, on this well-deserved award. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be able to talk with you this afternoon about your life and your work. And I was thinking when we met 40 years ago at the Women Exploring Theology Conference at Grailville, who would have thought that we'd be sitting up here speaking this afternoon. Um, so would you begin, please, by telling us a little bit about your family background? Um, Probably many of you know that I'm uh, German, but I'm born in Romania, um, which uh, was colonized by the Austrian-Hungarian Empire under Maria Theresia, and had German communities living there 
Um, so I'm partially uh, an offspring of a colonizing <laughs> people uh, <laughs> who were mostly farmers who tried to uh, pacify the land. I was six years when uh, Romania and uh, uh, was invaded by Russians and the German army moved back and we moved uh, with the army from village to village to Hungary and then to Austria and then to Bavaria. Uh, so I uh, have experienced the um, the fate of so many people today who have to flee and who are displaced people. Uh, I, I can uh, well remember uh, that as a child I was uh, surprised by the adults because um, my grandmother was begging for food and um, she got a big piece of cake and um, my brother and I got the first uh, uh, got the cake, and we were so excited about it. And all the grown-ups were standing around us, crying, saying, "These poor children will never mm. eat li cake in their life." I'm sorry, <laughs> I must to say, I have much too much eaten cake. <laughs> uh, the other. Uh, memory I have, which probably has uh, influenced my thinking, is uh, Horizon. I was born, uh, or Romania where I was born, was a flat uh, country. And um, I always thought as a child that heaven and earth meet <laughs> at the horizon. Uh. <laughs> and I never forget the uh, first time I saw a mountain, and I realized that I will never get to the end of the world where heaven and earth will meet. But then when, I, when we moved on, I realized that um, to move on means always changing horizons and opening horizons mm -hmm. and ever new horizons. So these are the two, uh, two memories I have from uh, my earliest childhood. So it sounds like you were a little bit of a theologian even then. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> Horizon, my last book is uh, on Horizon, and uh, yeah, I, Horizon has, has always fascinated me. So how did you get from that difficult childhood to doing a doctorate in theology? <laughs> uh, that is half a miracle, like you could say. <laughs> I belong not to the 48 percent, <laughs> but to the five or less percent of Germans who um, uh, five percent uh, who have gotten a university degree. I am female. That was below five percent at the time. I'm working class. I come from a rural background. I am a re I was a refugee, and I was Catholic. These were all the groups uh, who were below the 5% mark. So I belong to the 5% category. And I was lucky I had a pastor who uh, was an intellectual. And um, whenever I wanted to go and drop school in order to make money, mm. uh, he always told me, the, uh, I couldn't do that because of the parable of the talents. You all know the parable of the talents, that you have to uh, work with the talents and not bury them. So uh, that is how mm. I got finally uh, to Abitur and, uh, uh, and uh, could go to university. But I did not want first to go to university, but I wanted to work in church ministry and um, the, uh, the rule was that uh, one had to do a practicum in church, uh, in, church uh, in, uh, in the charity's office or in some office. And I knew I wouldn't be a good secretary. <laughs> so I had uh, argued that I should be in a parish uh, half of the practicum. 
And I was promoted in charity's office, but I didn't hear about Parrish. So I met the Monsignor on the street, and I said to him, look, uh, you promised me that I would go get to a parish and the summer is almost over, and I'm still not there. And so he looked at me and he said, uh, you have to remember, uh, we will promise you things which we won't keep. Yeah. And so I said, sorry, I never <laughs> can get used to that. So I enrolled in the university for uh, German literature, religion, and and uh, history. And uh, I was at the same time working on the youth, in the youth office. So I learned uh, that uh, the people who studied for high school and uh, for school theology were mini theologians. And uh, so I decided I had to do the full course. <laughs> if I did theology, I wanted to do the full course of theology. And um, I enrolled uh, then uh, for the full course of theology uh, in Würzburg. I was the first woman to do so. And because of the war, I had a German scholarship, a state scholarship. And the state scholarship did not want to continue because nobody ever knew that a Catholic girl could study theology, and that was a professional <laughs> education. So I had to go to the bishop and ask him whether or not um, he would give approval and, so, and write to the government that that was indeed professional education, so I could get my scholarship. So the bishop whom I knew through my pastor, uh, who knew me for a long time, he looked at me and he said, I don't think I can do so. Yeah. And I said, why not? And so he said, the problem with you is that you see the wounds of the church very clearly, but instead of spreading the blanket of love over wow. them, you point with your finger at wow. them. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> I uh, said uh, to uh, your Excellency, if I would think uh, that uh, the patient is comatose, I would spread the blanket of love. But since I think there's a chance of survival, <laughs> I have to operate. <laughs> so uh, he gave me permission, but he said, um, you can do it, uh, I give you permission, but we won't have any jobs for you. Um, you have to be prepared to go and wash dishes. And I tell this always as a success story because I've never in my life washed dishes for anybody. <laughs> so uh, bishops can be wrong too. Um, I uh, did uh, my uh, MDiv then in Würzburg and uh, my licentiate, because I didn't come from an uh, academic background, they told me before I could do a doctorate, I should first do a licentiate. Uh, it's a degree in Europe uh, which allows you to teach. Uh, it's a little more than an MA. And, um, so I did a licentiate, and um, when it was published, uh, they told me I could have gotten a doctorate if I had applied, but I didn't. So. Um, <laughs> I, uh, apply, uh, I started then with a doctorate in New Testament studies, and um, I uh, went to my doctor father and <clears throat> asked him for a scholarship <clears throat> since I had done uh, the MA and the licentiate with summa cum laude. I thought I would be qualified to get a doctor uh, a scholarship. And he told me um, he couldn't recommend me. He had three doctoral scholarships to uh, recommend, and he couldn't do so because as a woman, I would not have a future in theology, mm -hmm. and he needed to give some money to those people mm -hmm. who had a future. Mm -hmm. So um, I obviously was very depressed about this, but luckily, um, 
another professor I met on the street, and he asked, how are you coming along with your doctorate? And I said, oh, I have to stop. I don't have any money. I have no uh, after July or August. And so he offered me a job in Münster. And uh, because the professor said I couldn't get a scholarship, I, uh, I came to Münster, and there Francis and I met, and things turned out well, despite <laughs> of professorial uh, statements. So, but uh, uh, at the first AISBL meeting in 1971 in Atlanta, uh, the Women's Caucus, Carol Christ had brought together the Women's Caucus a people or a group of women uh, from whom the Women's Caucus grew. And um, there I was in uh, the room, an immigrant, and uh, just, um, just um, uh, newly in the country. And I realized uh, that I was the only married woman in the room who had a full-time job. Wow. So, uh, because uh, Francis and I uh, were um, insisted uh, that uh, we would get equal jobs, and we did at Notre Dame, Indiana. So, I'll, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm just so struck by how early you were you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love, I love that story. I love that story of the bishop. Um, but I know that you wrote one of your theses on women, and I wondered how you came to do that. I uh, did uh, in uh, two theses. I did for my licentiate a thesis on ministries of women in the church because uh, the progressive uh, theology, which uh, then uh, was decisive for the council of uh, Küng and Rana and so on, uh, argued that uh, lay people should work for the world and clergy and nuns should work for the church. Here I was, I had just decided to study the full course of theology, and I missed my vocation <laughs> because I had no interest to become a nun, and I couldn't <laughs> become a priest either. So I had to write a dissertation, mm. and I wrote a dissertation on ministries of women in the church, uh, which was a critique of the progressive theology in light of the practice, the actual practice of women um, in, uh, in the churches, not just in the Roman Catholic Church, but also in the Protestant uh, churches. And uh, so that's how I came to, um, to uh, do the Ministry of Women dissertation, uh, which was later published. And then I did a, a dissertation uh, on in the in New Testament studies on the priesthood of all believers. And that was also yeah. interesting yeah. because Schnackenburg um, took me aside and said, you have to do this dissertation. Didn't ask whether or not I wanted. You have to do this dissertation. I said, why? And he said, because I couldn't ask any of my clergy students to do this because it's much too dangerous. Mm. So I, yeah. I, had, yeah. uh, so, uh, I had the question of um, doing a dissertation on actually a dogmatic or systematic topic, the priesthood of all believers, which was a big issue in the uh, Reformation time. And then I did uh, the second part of the dissertation was on uh, Imperial, imperium and kingship in the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So I had to, because of my professor, I had to work out hermeneutically how I could bring the two fields, mm -hmm. uh, dogmatics and New Testament studies together and still keep their integrity. Well, actually, you, you've said in a number of contexts, Elizabeth, that being trained in Germany shaped your sense of yourself as a scholar in a particular way, and I, I'm really hearing that, and you're talking about uh, your professor. Would you talk about that a little? Um, yeah, I, um, in Germany, uh, 
the faculties of theology, uh, faculties of, uh, not of divinity or of religion, but faculty of theology. And um, theology is the heading for all disciplinary areas of study. So theology is not identified with systematic theology or dogmatic theology as in the states is the case. So um, I, I remember um, at one of my first uh, SBL meeting, I met a, a, a famous uh, exegete who was a Jesuit and I, uh, I, I went to him and greeted him as a New Testament theologian. And he looked at me and he said, uh, young lady, I am not a theologian. I am a biblical scholar. Mm -hmm. So here you see the difference between mm -hmm. the US mm -hmm. understanding and uh, the uh, German understanding. So at the point that you wrote a thesis on women, would you have called yourself a feminist? Um, at the, as I said, I, I wrote my book on ministries of women in the church because I was interested in the theological status of lay people. And uh, since women are per definition uh, in the Roman Catholic Church uh, lay people, I took women as the example for lay people. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing so, I, uh, I realized that the issue or the problem of women is still very different from that of lay men. Uh, uh -huh. be, uh, because uh, there is a, um, a theology of women uh, that is built on the essence, essence of women, which already um, at the time was at work in the German context and has been then revived uh, by uh, John Paul II. Uh, it's called, uh, under the label, the new feminism. That means uh, this uh, understanding of women says women have a special essence different from men, and this essence is, um, is defined by motherhood, whether or not it's real motherhood or spiritual motherhood but motherhood is the essence of women. And uh, so in the process of writing yeah. my thesis, uh -huh. <laughs> I realized uh, uh -huh. that I wasn't subscribing to that and that uh, the question of women and women in the public of the church is a different question still as that of lay people. Uh -huh. And then in 1970, you came to the United States um, and of course, that was right at the beginning of the women's liberation movement. So you, you said a little bit about how you got pulled in at the first AORSBL meeting. Would you talk some more about how you came to consider yourself a feminist? You could say I was uh, already working in Germany, um, a crypto feminist. <laughs> I just didn't know it quite. <laughs> And uh, so I was also a crypto liberation theologian mm -hmm. because I, uh, I followed one of, uh, uh, of the maxims which liberation theology has, uh, has uh, promulgated, namely that context is as or more important than text. So um, context of women's struggles against uh, sexism and for equality is decisive in terms of liberation theology. So when I came to the States, uh, the difference was not so much in theory, but uh, it was really in experience and practice. I came to the States and I experienced a women's movement. Uh, there was a ARSBL uh, meeting in 1971 where uh, the women's uh, as I said, Carol Christ got together women and we formed the Women's Caucus Religious Studies. And because there were so few uh, biblical women scholars interested in uh, the issue, I became the first uh, co-chair, which was decisive because I wasn't buried in the Catholic kind of university <laughs> in Indiana. Uh, that opened to me the doors for uh, the meeting at Cradleville, which you mentioned. Uh, I was uh, 
then on the Catholic Women Committee, Bishops Committee on Women in 73, um, at the ordination conference in 74, and in 75 I had a sabbatical at Union Theological Seminary and uh, experienced the New York area feminist scholars in religion. So uh, for me uh, to experience uh, these uh, different meetings and groups was to experience a movement and uh, to become in, uh, involved in a movement. So um, I learned uh, to understand myself for the first time to become a theologian, a, not, a theologian who would not uh, just teach and continue the progressive theology of the fathers whom I learned, but a theologian who would have different subjects, who would uh, know, uh, who would need to listen to the questions and issues raised by women. And so I became a theologian, a feminist theologian, who, uh, <coughs> want, uh, who saw that it was important to articulate knowledge uh, not for knowledge's sake, but for art, uh, articulating knowledge that would be helpful to women struggling against injustice and for well-being. And their biblical study is very important because uh, women who struggle against uh, violence, for instance, or so on, and are biblically, uh, have biblical texts internalized, need to be empowered to read these texts differently. So my understanding, uh, which evolved there as a feminist theologian, is a theologian who will articulate uh, uh, knowledge that empowers uh, women and other people, uh, other subordinated people like women. Uh, the, my, I always say at lectures, I have a bumper sticker definition of feminism. <laughs> and it's due to you, because you gave me years ago uh, a sticker for my, a bumper sticker for my car. And um, the bumper sticker defines feminism as the radical notion that women are people. That means uh, this is, uh, alludes to the radical democratic understanding these are people and uh, makes a uh, democratic public claim, as I understand feminism, but uh, that women are people. people women are people um, defining uh, society and defining religion. Feminist theology as a critical theology of liberation was one of your early groundbreaking essays. Um, it certainly had a profound impact on me and I know it has remained a base point for your work, and it's, it's that I hear and the bishop saying to you, you focus on the wounds of the church. I mean, you were already a critical theology of liberation then as a young woman. Um, but would you talk about how that perspective has shaped your work as a biblical scholar and as a theologian? Uh, for me, it was very important to have a sabbatical year at Union Theologic Seminary in New York. And um, you and Carol Christ uh, had uh, founded or called together the New York, uh, uh, New York Feminist Scholars in Religion. So we had meetings and uh, so I came in active uh, dialogue and discussion with a very high powered intellectual uh, women uh, who then all became, or many of them became leading feminists. Um, the, uh, I, I never forget, I, I, at Notre Dame when I was in faculty meetings and I would say something and nobody would react. So it would go around to other faculty and then finally one of my colleagues would repeated in other words, and then it was a brilliant idea. <laughs> and I always thought, uh, it must be because of my accents, they didn't understand me. <laughs> 
So I never forget, I was uh, in, uh, at the New York scholars, uh, feminist scholars in religion meeting, and there were all these high-powered women sitting in the room, and one by one told the same story, namely that they made contributions and weren't heard. <laughs> So, and they all didn't speak with an accent. <laughs> so that was for me the, ex, uh, the basic experience mm. there. Now, I wrote the article because I also disagreed with some of the discussions that were going on. And uh, if you look, it is feminist. Um, in the early uh, women's feminist movement, especially in religion, there was a, um, the widespread essentialism in the understanding of women. And as I said before in my first book, I had deconstructed this kind of approach. So I was always arguing um, that I was not just a woman, I was also an immigrant, I was also a German, I was also so many different things, but I couldn't get uh, across. So I had to uh, articulate uh, different um, understanding of feminist, namely feminist not just understood in terms of the essential difference mm -hmm. of women to men. So that is feminist. Theology, I was a Vatican II Catholic and I had experienced theological studies as opening windows and doors in comparison to uh, catechism and all the dogmatic kind of understanding. Whereas many people, especially at Gradleville, had a quite negative mm. experience mm. In that of theology in that theological studies. So I, uh, I wanted to articulate a positive understanding of uh, theology, uh, of progressive theology, and not rejecting theology just as patriarchal. Uh, then critical, I understood critically in terms of the Frankfurt School and according to Horkheimer, a theory that is critical must meet three criteria. First, uh, the first criterion is it has to be explanatory. That is, it must develop a theory of society that explains what is wrong. Secondly, uh, such a critical theory must be practical. That is, it must identify the agents that seek to bring about change. Mm -hmm. And third, a critical theory must be normative. That is, it must articulate the practical goals, ethical norms, and theoretical visions for a different future, free from exclusions and dominations. So feminist theology as a critical mm. Mm. theology of liberation. And uh, I did my, uh, call in this essay my theological approach, not a critical liberation theology. I did not think that theology was liberation mm. or liberating. Ah. Mm -hmm. I called it a critical theology of liberation. That means theology had to explore what a liberation means, and it must always be critical because it cannot say what um, liberation means without saying what's wrong and uh, what uh, the uh, norms and um, structures of powers are that prevent and prohibit liberation. So. Uh, feminist theology as a critical theology of liberation then um, enabled me to look at scripture also not just uh, as used by the oppressed for liberation, but scripture also as a tool of oppression mm -hmm. and uh, not just of liberation and therefore I developed the hermeneutics of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I uh, was, yeah, just, so, yeah. uh, when uh, then uh, this article appeared and was written when I, uh, but appeared when I had returned to Notre Dame uh, after my sabbatical with tenure, and uh, I remember my chairman had me three or four times in his office 
as saying someone who's writing such an article should not teach at a Catholic university. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I moved away mm -hmm. from Notre Dame, because um, as many people today experience, the pressures of not being able to, or not having the mm -hmm. freedom to articulate theology um, are very strong. Yeah, that's just what I was going to ask you about, Elizabeth, because I remember that that article caused you a lot of trouble at the time. And when Carol and I published Woman Spirit Rising and we categorized you as a reformist, I remember you're laughing and saying, you're going to bring this into your chair. He would be very glad to hear that you were a reformist and not a revolutionary. I was saying, please make it public as much as possible. Well, your first book in English, In Memory of Her, has become very much a classic. How did you come to write it? In Memory of Her um, is product of these uh, developments. I was asked in the early 70s um, to write a book on women in the New Testament. And I had no interest to do so because I thought in my uh, uh, licentiate dissertation on women, ministry of women in church. I had gone through all the biblical text and there was nothing more to say about it. <laughs> and um, what I said was said, and so I wasn't interested in it. Uh, and in addition, uh, the books which still are very much alive, uh, women in the Bible or women in the New Testament um, represent a genre which is used to inculcate the cultural norms of femininity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to do a book like that. But then I was also a member, uh, I think they started in 74, 75, of the world, uh, social world in early Christianity group. And there, uh, Gert Tyson's work was very much discussed in, on early Christianity and very, um, uh, much uh, very well known. And Tyson follows Strolch in the argument that um, that Christianity uh, or Paul, uh, the Pauline writings and post-Pauline writings uh, are preaching uh, love patriarchalism. That it means uh, you find the texts are patriarchal, but uh, they are softened and by love. So I always volunteered to do a paper for the group on love patriarchalism because I wanted to take it apart. And they always said, oh, no, 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 no. Why don't you do something on the book of Revelation? <laughs> so I had to write in <coughs> my refer to, just to, uh, to get clear for myself um, how one could read early Christian history and early Christian text differently. Uh, in addition, uh, in the uh, 70s and uh, 80s, there was great work appearing in uh, feminist uh, history and uh, feminist uh, literary studies and so on. So I thought it would be challenging to write uh, a feminist history of early Christianity in and to see whether early Christian beginnings could be told otherwise than it has been traditionally be told. So uh, in memory of her is not a book about women in, but it is a feminist history of early Christianity that seeks to recover the historical presence and agency of women. Um, Feminists and liberation historians also had made us conscious by uh, in the 70s and the early 80s that history is written by the winners. Those who uh, have lost, who, those who were vanquished in history do not have a written history. So for me, therefore, it was important to produce a written history. The other issue was that, um, and in memory of her is often read in such a fashion, 
the Protestant model of historiography is that we have the golden egalitarian beginnings, and then there is rapid, rapid, because it's already beginning with Paul, rapid <laughs> decline into patriarchy. And I recall I was at a panel discussion and uh, I was saying that is not how the book should be read and a colleague of mine was sitting beside me and told the audience, no, that's how you have to read it. <laughs> so I, uh, so um, I, I was trying to argue and uh, it's of misread because what I was working with is early Christian history as a history of struggle that did not end in the first century, did not end in the uh, fourth century, did not end in the 15th century, but it's ongoing. So uh, I was uh, interested in having a reconstructive model that uh, would not cut us off from early Christianity, but that would allow us to think in terms of um, uh, the uh, work and the history of um, women. And um, if you recall, I have at the end of, uh, in memory of her, I have the epilogue on the ecclesia of mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And ecclesia does not mean just church, as it usually translate, but ecclesia means the radical democratic assembly of full citizens. So I was interested to see whether or not in early Christian writings one can rediscover the ecclesia as the radical democratic assembly in the spirit of full citizens. So, I, uh, so women are full citizens uh, in, uh, and uh, historians have to wrestle with how they can, despite of the difficult uh, language, androcentric language, and have to wrestle with um, how they can articulate that women have been and are full citizens, fully decision-making citizens. So I had, um, I wrote uh, three chapters, and I, I remember uh, introductory chapters, theoretical uh, chapters, uh, uh, one on language, one on historiography, um, and no, one on historic, and one on uh, hermeneutics. And I remember I was one night sitting in the middle of the night at two o'clock, or so, sitting there and saying, "Elizabeth, you're crazy. Nobody will read this book <laughs> because uh, feminists all uh, wouldn't read it because it had too many footnotes." <laughs> and uh, all this patriarchal uh, scholarly stuff. <laughs> and um, my colleagues wouldn't read it because... Um, it yeah, was feminist. It was feminist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, um, so I'm very happy that uh, this nightmare didn't come through. <laughs> um, let's talk specifically about the language of the Marty Award, which is for the public understanding of religion. How do you see your scholarship as contributing to that project? And maybe you could talk about the question in relation to your biblical scholarship and your understanding of what biblical studies should be. Um, the issue here is that feminist theory and uh, feminist um, studies uh, have argued, and I think rightly argued, that in a woman in modernity, and I would think even in antiquity, women and subordinate men were excluded from the public sphere. So, um, so to use an expression of Gustavo Gutierrez, all, all non-persons were not Const uh, their exclusion was constitutive of the public sphere of society as well as of religion. Uh, the democratic public sphere continues to be structured by the existing status differences and exclusions. And uh, if you look at the last uh, uh, election campaign, uh, 
uh, it is exactly uh, the people mm -hmm. who are excluded, who for the first time formed a coalition that made the, uh, made the uh, election um, successful. So uh, it is cons uh, constitutive of the public sphere, and I think the public, the discussion on the public sphere and religion are not cons uh, consistently or not sufficiently reflecting on uh, this, uh, that the public sphere is structured according to diff uh, status differences and exclusions. Hence, I, in my work, I sought to show that political theologies and religious studies uh, need to define as a public sphere of society and religion, not in the same exclusive way, but need to find and to realize uh, different understand, a different understanding mm -hmm. of the public sphere. Uh, beginning with my SBL presidential address in 1987, I have argued for a fundamental change in how we understand biblical studies. And you could apply this to all the other disciplines, disciplinary study, how we understand biblical studies and practices. Rather than to understand biblical studies in positivist and antiquarian times, I have argued we need to revision it as a critical practice of justice that understands language as a form of power and seeks to mine the power of the word as uh, inspiration for the global struggles for justice and well-being. And if you can see this, such a vision of biblical studies would require a lot, a lot of change. <laughs> Now, my <laughs> books, uh, Rhetoric and Attic, Jesus and the Politics of Interpretation, and The Power of the Word have sought to develop biblical studies in this different key and to persuade scholars to turn from being antiquarian scientists to transformative intellectuals who understand ourselves as uh, rhetoric as rhetoric in the public square, a rhetoric that is conditioned by the sociopolitical location, uh, the sociopolitical location and by the ethics of interpretation mm -hmm. and not by uh, antiquarian standards. Mm -hmm. uh, such a rhetorical understanding of biblical studies takes um, into <coughs> account not only the author and the interpreter, but also the audience or the public of the text. For example, most uh, books on First Corinthians and Paul will talk about the author, but very few talk about the audience. And um, uh, because, but we know through reading the author's text that in the audience of the Corinthian community, there were leading women. So if, uh, if we shift our focus from author to audience and social historical context, then we will be able to create a different kind of historical uh, and religious or theological Im uh, scriptural uh, imagination and meaning making and vision for the present and uh, the future. So how does this perspective, Elizabeth, affect your understanding of yourself as a teacher? Um, you, you said, you know, if this vision were to be adopted, a lot would have to change. Um, what's your vision of what graduate biblical education should be? I mean, we have to realize that as long as uh, graduate, uh, graduate biblical education on the uh, uh, ministry level or on the MA level uh, not changes, we will reproduce uh, the uh, same kind of 
scholarship. The same is true in terms of uh, doctoral education. As long as a critical understanding and analysis of power is not uh, part of doctoral education, nothing uh, will uh, change. So that's why I, in the last years I have shifted to uh, very strongly look at uh, the, um, the educational situation and what needs to be changed. Uh, there is, um, and that is discussed especially in uh, Germany, and it's not so much discussed here, there is the didactic triangle. The triangle mm -hmm. means, uh, and I have no black but the triangle <laughs> means uh, the uh, teacher uh, transmits uh, knowledge to students who then deposits this knowledge by writing it down or memorizing <laughs> it into their memory and then give it back in exams to the teacher. So it's uh, mm -hmm. what uh, Freire has called the banking model. <laughs> but uh, that is the uh, didactic triangle. So the issue is how, can, uh, how does this didactic triangle need to be changed into a circle of different mm -hmm. equals? where the teacher and uh, those uh, discussing or producing knowledge are equals, but they have, but they are different equals. As a teacher, I have uh, training and I have whatever. But uh, there are students who know something about journalism, I have no idea about. There are students who know something about economics, I don't know how to do the stock market, and so on. So, uh, so to change the, tri the triangle into a circle of um, different equals who work together but are conscious of their curiosity, socio-religious uh, mm -hmm. context, of the socio-religious pyramid of curiosity that produces or impacts on their uh, producing liberating knowledge that uh, transforms. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. uh, the different vision of education I tried to do. I have uh, published, uh, before I did uh, work on the triangle, I published Wisdom Ways, where I have seven steps of conscientization, and um, I, I think I'm probably the only uh, feminist scholar who has done not just scholarly work, but has also done a book uh, where, which concretely allows people to, who have no biblical mm. exegetical mm. training, tries to work with the text and analyze it in terms of power relations and mm. uh, I know that uh, students of mine who have taught um, illiterate women uh -huh. have had uh -huh. great success mm. with it. So that's why I'm always, mm. uh, exegetes always talk about readers, I always talk about um, uh, interpreters uh -huh. because not everyone can read but everybody can mm. interpret and we need that as a um, presupposition. Then uh, I have uh, done a book exactly on the triangle in democratizing biblical studies where I have tried to show how the circle of different equals produces knowledge and uh, with a, se a graduate seminar at Harvard and at the end uh, we, I have the student reflections on this experience. Mm -hmm. So anybody who is interested in that then uh, I have um, uh, initiated a seminar at CSBL, uh, which uh, ran for five years together with Kent Richards, the former uh, executive of SBL, in the hope <coughs> that that would impact a doctoral or the conversation in SBL on doctoral education and um, and so the book collects, uh, so we have collected the discussions of the five-year seminar in a book on transforming graduate biblical education and um, 
uh, the book has young scholars, minoritized scholars, to use the expression of uh, Fernando Segovia, and uh, has especially uh, scholars from Asia uh, who, because we had an international conference in Asia, uh, who reflect exactly on uh, biblical studies and how biblical studies as a discipline can be changed. When you uh, talked about the success of Wisdom Ways um, in work with illiterate women, it, it reminds me how your contributions to the public understanding of religion have by no means been limited to the US. I know you've worked with women's groups and taught all over the world. Would you talk a little bit about that work, what it's entailed and what it has meant to you? Uh, first of all, wherever I go uh, around the world, everybody thinks they are the only feminists around and they are the most beleaguered feminists around. <laughs> they all think America is a paradise of <laughs> feminism. And I always, uh, my first step is <laughs> to try to make clear. Disabuse them, huh? To disabuse them, <laughs> that's right. So, but um, I, I have seen my function uh, to make connections between people who otherwise would not have uh, these exchanges. Uh, I have done with uh, Professor Lee Troch, who is um, teaching uh, at, um, in Nijmegen in Holland, as well as in um, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, we have done uh, workshops uh, using the method of mm. uh, wisdom ways, and um, we have done them on uh, all kinds of topics, not just on biblical texts, but also Christology, power, uh, Candomblé, Mary, and, and so on. So <laughs> it's, it's really, and we always uh, have done it in, in terms of this model of uh, collaboration between um, equals, uh, but different. So, uh, so that is, uh, is uh, very important uh, that, um, People who speak different languages, who are often very critical of American and English, um, are getting in conversation with other people in, e uh, in uh, equal situations, talking, uh, having a kind of tool how to talk with each other. So that, that I see as one of my um, my most important thing. And lastly, but not least, uh, for me, that is uh, the most uh, important thing in personal terms, because I don't need my affirmation from the academy. I can do my work because I know so many people coming up to me and telling me uh, how important it is. Mm -hmm. So. If the academy doesn't want to recognize that feminist work is important, fine. Although, of course, today the academy did recognize that's it. Why, <laughs> that's why I think this is such a great event. Thank you. Um, but I think that's a great segue to opening things up. I mean, there I have, I have several more questions that I'd love to ask you, but I really want to give time to people um, sitting and listening to raise questions. And there are microphones uh, on the two aisles. And I'd ask people who want to raise questions to please come up to one of the mics um, and ask. And of course, it always takes the first one to break the ice. I always tell my audiences, talk to your neighbor, and then the eyes can be broken. Oh, well, okay, well, we could do that. You want to do that right. first? All right, so take two minutes uh, to talk to your neighbor uh, and decide what it is that you're burning to ask Elizabeth, uh, and then we will begin with the questions. Except it's terrible the lights. I, mean, I know, see. I know. It's very weird. Not to be able to see them. Mm 
I don't I disagree. Oh, we, you left out the chair. I know. I know. I'll, so I'll ask you at the end. We ran out of questions. Okay, I see that people are beginning to line up at the mic. Um, so I will start on this side, and what we'll do is go back and forth. So, yes, please, your question. Thank you very much, um, especially for the life story, uh, because you brought back, uh, you demonstrated early in your life the determination to be treated equally that my, my Schwäbische Mutter, my German mother, illustrated also as a maid. My question, I worked in Germany in 1991 to 95, and during that time, I had a very good woman employee that I wanted to recommend for promotion. And she looked at me with rather sad eyes and just said to me, oh, Paul, you don't understand. And I didn't. And my question to you is, do you think that your move to the United States um, allowed you a freer reign in feminism that may not have been available to you had you remained in Germany? Oh, without question, I could not have done the work I have done uh, in Germany. Um, uh, not in the 70s and 80s. For instance, we visited my professor um, in around, uh, right after I got tenure, uh, in around 76 or so, and um, I asked him whether or not uh, women were at, um, now at faculties, admitted to, fac to teaching. And so he uh, looked at me and said, a lame, we have a layman teaching here. So I said, I asked for women. Are any women in Germany teaching at theological faculties? And so he turned around to his housekeeper and said, Frau Sonso, do you want to become my successor? Yeah. So that was the mental mentality <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> in the, uh, I, I was... Uh, on, uh, uh, I had a visiting uh, a semester at Tübingen in the 80s, and there I realized, uh, until then I thought always, oh, it would be much better to be a German professor. But uh, for this uh, 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 visiting semester, uh, this guest professor in uh, Tübingen, I realized I wouldn't want to be a German professor because all uh, the rooms that were available were like these rooms. You could not build circles. You could not put students in circles. Students were not used to ask questions. Students were not asked to, uh, used to challenge you. So I, uh, there's no question. And now the situation especially in the Roman Catholic uh, context, is so bad that um, obviously I couldn't teach in Germany. Uh, George, George Faithful from Seton Hall University. I was wondering if you just had any advice for uh, the next generations of feminist theologians, historians, and educators. Um, what remains to be done? <laughs> And how <laughs> should we go about doing it? I, uh, it is, um, uh, I think you asked me, uh, the last question was in terms of the next, what's the differences between our generation, the next generation, uh, or the future generation. And for me, it is striking that, um, and uh, depressing, that in many places, uh, the struggle is still the same. I still have students coming to me from other classes telling me that they were not allowed to, uh, or they were not taken seriously when raising questions of anthropocentric language, for instance. Uh, I still have uh, doctoral students who wonder whether or not they put on their CV that they have done something feminist, whether or not they will get a job. So uh, I still think um, what 
uh, you have to trust uh, that what my bishop said, that you will not have to go wash dishes and you decide to do what you want and that you will, never will have to do it. But uh, I think the struggle is still there. Thank you. <clears throat> On this side, and I should have said, please do identify yourself. Hello, Reverend Karen Fitzlabarge from the Presbyterian Church USA. Elizabeth, I was with you at the Women's Ordination Worldwide Conference in Canada where we were ordaining women to be priests against the will of the Catholic Church with all of the changes that have been going on recently in the Catholic Church. Do you have any ideas, hopes, um, ways that we can maybe influence change still for women in the light of that huge hierarchy? Uh, that is a difficult question. I mean, uh, if you look at, um, I, I normally would have said, uh, don't be ordained, become a feminist uh, theologian or become a <laughs> theologian, because if you look at uh, what women have achieved within uh, the Catholic theological context is really, we have made great progress in terms of uh, theology and feminist uh, theology and uh, education. But uh, now we, uh, I mean, if I remember um, Margaret Farley or Elizabeth Johnson, uh, so uh, fem uh, feminist theologians who are uh, in, uh, incorporated into church structures because they are sisters or nuns um, are already experiencing it. Um, I have for years said um, we should organize uh, for women to become cardinals. Uh, not because I would love to wear the red kind <laughs> of dress, but... Um, would be nice, though. Would be nice, right? <laughs> but uh, cardinals, because uh, I would love to see the Vatican go into uh, pretzels because uh, to argue why women can be cardinals because the Cardinal's office is, has nothing to do with Jesus, has nothing to do with the early church, um, has, uh, is really uh, just an office created for the Pope, and it's the only democratic office in the Roman Catholic Church. So I say, as long as all bishops have to be male, all women, uh, all cardinals should be women, <laughs> and we have, would have solved still the problem. I'm very much afraid. <laughs> I'm very much afraid that uh, the Vatican will see the light and will have deaconesses, um, mm. and uh, they will not be equal to deacons, but it will be a special woman's um, service uh, or woman's office, and it will mean the cre even greater exploitation of women. Because most of the work that is done within uh, the Catholic Church is done by women. Yes. But uh, it's unacknowledged and unpaid. Mm -hmm. But there is no feminine ending for the word deacon. I can't hear can It's always the same ending, can male or female. Yeah, can, can you speak up, please? Oh, I'm sorry. There is no feminine ending for the word deacon in the New Testament. It's the same word for male or female, just FYI. Okay. Uh, there's no feminine ending for the word deacon in the New Testament. Yeah, that's right. There is no, uh, uh, that's my constant. <laughs> <laughs> I am constantly writing to all uh, these groups where who argue for deaconesses. <laughs> uh, and, that, uh, and I think Phoebe was not a deacon. That's a misnomer because Paul is called a deacon. Nobody calls Paul a deacon. So, um, <laughs> Phoebe uh, was equal to Paul, and uh, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 20 years ago, you spoke in Miami, Florida. Your and name? Uh, Diane Schoff from Miami, Florida. And you spoke to a church, a Presbyterian church in Miami, and you exegeted 1 Corinthians 13. And your Thank exegesis you. made a difference. Thank you. Would you speak up, please? It's, um, uh, it's very difficult because the lights, I can see you. Okay. And I <laughs> you were in Miami, and you offered us an exegesis of 1 Corinthians 13. And I want to tell you that 20-some years later, as a minister and a spiritual director, 
your exegesis has made a difference in my work and in my ministry. This morning I was in a session where I heard a speaker speak of spiritual regret and professional regret. And given what you've shared with us today, do you have spiritual or professional regrets that you would want to share with us? Actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like what I'm doing, and I hope it has some fruits. But I don't have regrets. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Will Gaffney from the Lutheran Seminary at Philadelphia. Oh, hi. hi, Elizabeth. You were looking at having a multifaceted identity before it was cool. Could you talk about the complexity of feminism in terms of those of us who do practice religion, some feminists do not practice religion, sometimes that leads to conflict. Um, can you also talk about the complexities of race and class that have made the feminist movement a little bit complicated? I mean, um, the complexities are there, there and are still there, but I hope that um, the, uh, the uh, discussions in, around identity politics will move to coalition politics, also among uh, feminists. Um, I have, uh, because, uh, because I never uh, agreed with uh, the essentialized understanding of women. Uh, I have early on developed a different understanding of patriarchy, uh, which uh, I uh, named uh, curiarchy in order to distinguish it from patriarchy as uh, the domination of men over women. And um, for a, a curiarchal understanding, uh, the interstructuring of race, uh, class, um, and all the other uh, identity markers are crucial. And as you well know, uh, the uh, interstructural, uh, uh, the uh, interstructuring theories have been developed, especially uh, by um, uh, African or black, American or black feminists. So, so I see. Um, I see a, a move towards uh, an understanding that is not uh, identity kind of understanding, but a political understanding. I don't know if that says something. Thank you. I have a theoretical question. <clears throat> in, my, in one of my systematic theology classes, I, I make a point that there's not one feminism, but many feminisms. And one way I sort out feminist theologians is I go to deep assumptions. And so this is a question I ask my students when I have them read Elizabeth Johnson, and then I have them read you. I ask them this question. In, in each of these theologians, which is primary, experience or language? Does experience shape language, or does language shape and structure experience? And at least the answer I get to work from them, work out of them, is that Elizabeth Johnson would be experience as primary to language, but that you would say language is primary to experience, which is a basic axiom of postmodernist thought. Would you agree? I don't know if I would I agree. If I were your student, I would say it's a chicken and egg question. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't say either one. So uh, I, I don't think you can have uh, experience without language, and you can't have language without experience. So, uh, so I, I don't. 
I don't know. I uh, have, I think, methodologically, uh, the issue of language is a very important issue and has not received sufficient attention um, in, uh, among, uh, in, uh, among theoreticians and uh, thinkers, namely the question that language shapes uh, the understanding of our world and our language is um, is curiocentric language that is master oriented or defined uh, lord defined language um, so if I learn to speak uh, I internalize this uh, language and my experience is shaped by it. And at the other hand, I have experiences that, um, that uh, lead to understanding the language differently. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Hello, Elizabeth, uh, Dean Smith uh, from Sydney, Australia, down under. Um, thank you, it's been a real treat to hear, hear your story. Uh, a question uh, you mentioned about graduate studies and uh, how that would need to change and the question of power. Would you be able to say something a little more about that? Could you please repeat it? Um, I, I didn't get... Sorry. Uh, you spoke about um, the possible changes to graduate education mm -hmm. and the graduate. issue of mm -hmm. power. Um, could you say a little bit more about how you would see that working itself out? How, what would need to change and what are the issues about power that would need to be considered? Um, the issues are, is that, um, let's say, that doctoral education, also ministerial education, still is patterned after the model that was um, alive and well in biblical studies in the 70s or 60s or so. And um, uh, we still operate with an understanding of knowledge that is abstract and antiquarian. So um, to change, uh, and, and the problem is that if you bring different populations to the uh, task, uh, namely people uh, from ch China or people from Asia, you have different, uh, or different Africa, you have different languages, but uh, th there is uh, still the training in the same kind of uh, Euro-American understanding of biblical studies as uh, it has been developed in the 20th century, let's say. So, um, so for me, uh, the most important thing would be that uh, we change the um, didactic triangle, that, we, uh, that our students not only need to be able to analyze the text or something like this, but they also need to be able to uh, reflect uh, and to analyze uh, their context, the context of the text as well as uh, their own context. They, uh, uh, we need to train students not just in philology and archaeology and so on, but in uh, contemporary science too. And that is, as far as I can, can see, not the case in biblical studies. Thank you very much. Um, if there aren't further questions, let, let me conclude then by asking you, Elizabeth, given what you've just said, um, what would be your advice to current graduate students, especially those who might be studying in an institution that's still working on the old model? Um, as I have argued in but she said, I think, uh, and I think it's still the case, um, that women and minoritized students have still to become bilingual and to do double work. It shouldn't be the case, but it is the case. 
That means uh, we have to learn uh, the uh, dominant academic languages mm -hmm. in our fields, but we also have to learn and not to unlearn our own language. And uh, we have to uh, mm -hmm. our own questions mm -hmm. and uh, to articulate uh, them uh, in terms of um, all the great insights, uh, not just of feminist theology, but queer, but uh, post-colonial, um, African-American, uh, whatever. Uh, different voices that are, have worked in, to try to change the paradigm in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. So uh, I, I'm sorry to say, but it's still so that um, students, um, elite students who um, have not to ch have not to do this double work but it's still that women and uh, minority students have to do the double work as it is traditionally the case and I think still have to, uh, to do they still have to uh, know the frameworks the standard dominant frameworks and they have to struggle not to lose their own voices, not to neglect and silence their own experience, not to forget their own people. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to add to our conversation? I would say uh, to uh, young, uh, I would oh, add. Oh, sorry, there's, there's actually another yeah. question. Okay. Okay, so let's hear first. Yeah, my name is Sabine. I'm a German too. I live in Chile now. And just, just this point, we started in Chile with a group of women to translate, let's say, in, this, in their Spanish, the Bible. We started with the first page, let's say, with Genesis, and immediately we stood or we had a lot of questions. That means if you say as a Chilean not or non-educated woman in the academic sense, I can't accept that God speaks to me in an imperative. And it seems to be a linguistic, uh, a ling linguistic question, but it is more. Or if you say, okay, Jesus in the Latin American context could be um, um, a countryman, poor, perhaps black. The question is, could he be a woman? It is a question uh, marking boundaries for all this. You can say, okay, today Jesus could be black, but could he be gay? You understand the question. It is, it is more rhetorical, but it leads to, um, to a horizon. And in our group, independent of the result of this translation, the question came up, what or what um, will be the essence of Christianity if we really change all this, the imperatives, if we include uh, the feminine part of us and all this. Yeah, it is, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, this is a very, complex question um, as I don't think we can ask uh, for the or we should ask for the essence of women we shouldn't ask for the essence of Christianity I think either uh, the language issue and there we go uh, back to the question uh, the language issue is a important question because if our um, our language, whether or not we say Jesus was a woman or Jesus was queer or um, Jesus was a, 
I, I forgot what else you said, <laughs> Jesus was uh, a man. Um, we label it, I mean, and we, uh, our labels are not independent of social structures. So gender is a, a name that is uh, socially constructed and conditioned by that. So I wouldn't ask for the essence of Christianity. I would ask what can Christian vision do for people who struggle for survival, for dignity, for uh, happiness, for life? Which is a different question than the question of the essence of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, did you want to have a final word, Elizabeth? Um, no, I leave to you the oh. final word. <laughs> okay. Well, my final word is thank you very much. Congratulations again. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.